you sometimes try to overcomplicate things where you think an outperformer might be this loss-making company that's going to do something so unique and so complex or this very complex business that only you understand what exactly they do from the annual report. Sometimes it could just be simpler businesses. And I think it's just easier to focus on those type of businesses. There were, there were so many examples of companies where they had two, three core products in one industry. They were already profitable. Rivals just couldn't replicate and they turned out to be outperformers. Day Day authored a highly insightful book called Global Outperformers, where he researched businesses that returned 1,000% or more to shareholders in just one decade. Additionally, he is the CEO of Jenga Investment Partners, which invests in global public and private equity markets. I want to get into the details of how Jenga invests, but first I want to begin by discussing your research. I'd love to know why you decided to do this research and what previous book, people, or research inspired you to do it. Yeah, so I think generally in any career um, I, I was going to get into, I always wanted to study the successful stories. So in investment, I'll be studying success, successful stocks or all the people. And with global art performance, all we did was that we had 100% focus on the stocks that did well over the last 10 years. Um, in terms of the timing, um, I originally planned to do it ending 2021. And but when I started the research, there were just so many stocks doing well. And I just felt I wasn't get, going to have a good perspective of the truth, basically. And so I shifted it to a year after, being 2022. And the number of our performers was basically cut in half. So I, I felt the research would have a lot more authentic um, quality, per se. Yeah. And in terms of what inspired me, I mean, there were, there were, lo there were lots of research of similar content, um, but two, just in terms of the two I came across, that I thought were quite helpful. One was Chris Meyer's 100 Baggers, which is an amazing book. And the other one was a research, I think, The Makings of a Multibagger by Alter Fox, a hedge fund based in the US. They also did something similar. But both were really insightful for me in terms of while I was writing the book. Yeah, when I when I read it, that's kind of what I would have imagined you, you would have been um, inspired by. The only other one that I could think of that comes even close, but it's a lot older, is the one that inspired Chris Mayer, which was the, um, the uh, Thomas Phelps book. But yeah, I, I, I absolutely love the research. How, so how long were you working on it for? Um, I, from when I started doing the research to when I finished the first draft, it took about three months um, over the summer um, last year. So I mean, generally at Django, what I try to do is like every summer, I try to do like a big project. Some get, some get published, some don't. Um, last year's event got published and usually over the summer break. So that's what I was doing um, during the summer. So are you working on a big project right now then? Yeah, we are. But I think it's going to take this and next year's summer to produce, um, not just one summer. Awesome. Can't wait. Hope, yeah. I hope that's published. Yeah. So you mentioned that you restricted the study to only include businesses with over $50 million market caps as businesses with lower valuation than that would have little interest from institutions. How would including businesses with less than $50 million market caps have affected your results? So if we went without including the, so actually the companies were less than $550 million as of May 31st, 2022. So how you get to 50 million is 50 million compounded 1,000% would give you 550 million. So that's actually the starting point. But if we included all types of companies, so even companies of market value of 1 million, what happens is that the number of our performers goes from 446 to 935. And when you look within the micro cap, so like, sorry, nano cap space, what we had when we looked at companies worth less than 50 million was that they were overrepresented. So I think the number was about 67% of all the outperformers came from just that segment, even though they only um, represented 47% of, of the universe. Uh, yeah, so that makes sense that you would have eliminated them. And so I guess if, if, you'd looked, if you had looked at the results and the, you know, the different segments that you put, um, you know, cyclicals and, and stuff like that, would these would the would the nano caps have fit into there or was it just you know was it just an absolute you know madness of of, of different types of businesses? I mean, there was there was a madness of different types of businesses. I, I tried to quantify which were turnarounds and which were cyclicals, but I mean, what happens is that you have businesses that shift among those different segments. So initially, it's a 
special situation and then become the turnaround and then next minute is a compounder. So it's hard to like put them by number in those buckets. Um, but what I would say is in terms of the nature of the journey they used and get becoming an outperformer, I mean, it was quite a wide range um, of them. So increasing operating margins was a big driver for a large percentage of your outperformers. You mentioned three main drivers of margin expansion. One, effects of volume growth on fixed costs. Two, pricing power. And three, reduction in sales from less profitable products or services. Mm. What were some of the identifiable signals investors should look for to identify businesses that are currently going through or have the opportunity to expand margins? Mm. So, I mean, the margin expansion, growth, and low valuations are the main big factors in terms of getting to um, being an outperformer. And when you look at margin expansion, you basically can book at them into two areas. One are internal factors where it's in the company's control, and then you have external factors. So from an external factor, I mean, one of the industries that had a lot of outperformers were the salmon companies. And that was all driven external. So we have the price that all the companies have to follow. So it's a commodity business. And in that situation, what you're really trying to understand is how sustainable is this price for? So with salmon, you can't wake up the next morning and say you want to build your own farm. You know, you, 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 ha you need to have the right aquatic regions. And I think really only Norway and Chile really have that at a global scale. So you have supply that's a natural constraint. And then on the demand side, salmon is growing, giving people are looking for more healthy sources of meat. It's not going anywhere. So in terms of understanding the cycle, um, that's a good signal. So you want to be in those industries where supply is constrained for certain reasons, demand's growing, even though it's cyclical. And at the same time, you're focused on companies that have a mainly low cost advantage, room for growth, room to drive volume, and uh, they're just doing the simple things really well. Um, and a lot of companies exercise that. And I guess on the, on the more internal factors, you're looking at it more from a micro perspective. You're really trying to understand what exactly is going on in this business and why it can drive you know, operating margins. And I mean, there are three main sources. The best companies were the ones that were able to combine the different internal factors. So for example, they're able to raise prices mainly driven by having better products or services. They were able to drive volume by expanding to new markets and all sorts. I think those were the businesses that really had, you know, really high um, performers. And with them, it's just understanding how the business works, how it functions, and why exactly they're raising prices. Is this something that's sustainable or is this something that's unsustainable? And you have businesses that raise prices, but it's not very sustainable after two or three years. And you want to focus on those ones that can do that over the longer term. And that's mainly driven by having better products, having better services. Yeah. So obviously, you know, you can use, I guess, a screener, right? To just look at um, businesses with specific operating margins and then just look at their history to see if they're increasing. What other qualitative, I mean, you just mentioned, um, if the, if, the, if the business is selling an incredible product that's just better than its um, competitors, um, that might be a signal that they'd be able to keep their operating margins high or increasing over a specific period of time. What other qualitative factors did a lot of these outperformers show you? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give some examples of, of some of them that should operate in and, uh, margin expansion. I mean, so we, one of the buckets were the ones where they shifted into new products. So a good example was Neste. Neste, that's a um, the Finnish um, renewable. Well, initially they focused on just diesel. And then what happened was that I think in late 2009 and 2010s, 2010, they started going into renewable diesel through their own proprietary technology. And then what that happened was they allowed them to earn more margins per volume, so per liters or barrel you'd say. Um, and also there was a lot of subsidy because again, this was a product that was actually creating value for society really. So there was a lot more subsidy flowing into these areas for Neste. Now what then happened was that when you look at the percentage of their revenue, if you look through the years, um, rene the renewable diesel was going up while diesel itself was just going down. And uh, when you go to about 2017, I think it started becoming the majority. And then you really saw the margins go up. So I think margins went from like 1% or so, or 2% to like 12, 13%. I mean, 
you're able to get half of the, you know, our performance in terms of getting to 1000% from just switching products. So in that situation, you're really trying to understand the competitive edge the new product has over rivals. So next day again, they were the first mover in the industry and they still have that market leadership. So when you're thinking about it from a competitive view, it's still strong. Um, another example, I guess, of, of margin expansion was the ones that they didn't really change their product. They just impacted the non-product factors. So again, another good example here will be Britannia in India. So they make biscuits. I know it sounds weird um, making biscuits and telling you it's going to return 1,000%, but they made biscuits in, in India. And of course, India is a really large population, a billion plus. And what these guys did was they had legacy biscuit brands that had been around since 1800s, but a mixture of competition from Nestle and some other players and also internal mismanagement made their margins go down. New management came in, they kind of shifted their focus from just tier one to tier two cities in India. They renewed different partnerships with distributors, they cut down on wholesale, expanded more on like direct to consumer, and then also launched new products that were higher margin. And when you look at the combination of those factors, that's why they were able to, you know, grow revenue and grow earnings over time. And of course, get that margin expansion. And um, there were other examples as well. I mean, you had companies like Tesla, where, you know, I mean, I didn't introduce Tesla to anyone, but like you had companies like Tesla, where they had a better control of their cost by building more plants and going, expanding to China when they built like, you know, their plants in China, they were able to control cost better and just grow volume. And that's why they were able to get that margin expansion from loss making to profitability. So your study showed uh, a very high representation of India were outperformers with 91 total names, which was about 20% of the uh, total sample size. This is a country that has fascinated me, but I must admit it's far outside of my circle of competence. How do you view investing in countries that are outside of your native land in terms of being competent enough in their culture, business practices, and social governance, et cetera? So, I mean, from a, from a personal level, Every company I invest in is kind of outside my native land because, I mean, I'm from Nigeria. And I mean, since 2016, Nigeria has been 0% of my portfolio. So I'm kind of forced to like learn about, you know, different countries and culture. But I think, I think this question, so before like I focus more on India, I think this question can be boiled down into two key things. So one is that is the fact that human nature is human nature regardless of where you go. So whether you're in India, China, or the U.S., people go through periods of over-optimism and they go through periods of over-pessimism. And it's being able to understand that. I think you've solved 30% of the problem. So if you look at Asia, for example, you had Japan that had this mega bubble up until the late 80s, where the PE went up to 60, 60 times earnings. You didn't need to like understand the culture or understand you know financial statements to see that the market was, va was overvalued. By just looking at a top-down view, it's quite clear. And same thing when you go to Japan again, you look at 2012, um, you, you could tell that these things were undervalued. You see companies growing 20% earnings growth rate um, at eight times PE ratio. I mean, that doesn't, that screams or undervalued, especially if it's sustainable. So I think from a top down view, that's like you've done half of the work. Now, in terms of micro, so one of the fun things that, one of the things I really enjoyed with the study was that. It forced me to really look at places that I might not look from, uh, I guess, from my own portfolio, just because I don't understand things. And what I realized was that the really good companies, regardless of where they were listed, they pr provided their investors or shareholders with enough information. I think anyone could make decisions. So, I mean, I remember going through M3. M3 is a Japanese company. I mean, their financials were all in Japanese. But if you look at their prospectus from 1999 or 2000, it's so clear what exactly they were trying to do. So they basically built this healthcare platform where you can do all sorts of things. And what they were trying to do was make healthcare less time consuming, more cheap and a lot more efficient. And what's so clear in terms of the new product launches, their investments they were making, how management were thinking, regardless of the culture. And same thing with the companies in India. I mean, again, look at Britannia. When the new management came in 2013, I believe, like it was really clear in terms of what exactly he wants to do to get Britannia back into market leadership. And if you look through the years, he followed up, followed up on that. So regardless of it being in India or it being, I guess, a frontier market, I think good management will make it clear 
to shareholders in terms of what they want to do. Um, but with that said, I mean, it's at the end of the day, you still have to understand how things work locally. And I think that just comes from experience, reading things, speaking to local investors, speaking to local managers, and just building that competence over time. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense about, uh, I guess, the, I guess, kind of the way you, you're, you're explaining that the management in these, in these companies in other countries is really, really, really important. Um, you know, not that the business obviously isn't, but, you know, if you find a management team that um, seems trustworthy and maybe even has a really good track record, that's definitely going to help kind of remove a lot of the worries that investing in a foreign land would have. Yeah, I mean, the track record is so important because I try to, I mean, when I'm looking at, when I was doing the whole project from 2012 to 2022, I was trying to remove myself from 2022. I take myself back to 2012 and really follow on that track record before 2012 and also after. And I mean, it was just quite clear that a lot of these companies were consistent with what they were doing and with the goals they had set. And I think if you spend a lot more time focused on that track record, even with turnarounds, I think you'll be able to um, get some value out of that, regardless of the country you're in. So reflecting on your research, how many of these outperformers do you feel were predictable back in 2012? There are some big winners in super highly cyclical industries. Do you think that investors without an in-depth understanding of, say, mining or chemical industries would have been able to find some of these businesses early enough to capture the 1,000% upside? I think, I think this, this question would be a scope for the next book. <laughs> And which will be easier to, to find. I mean, it really depends on who you are and what your competence is. So from a personal angle, I really enjoy investing in consumer discretion and staples. One, because I, like I like looking at products and seeing what people are buying. Um, and I find it easier than, you know, diving into like chemicals I have no idea about. So in terms of who I am, I might find consumer easier than industrials. Now, someone who has an industrial background, they might find looking at chemicals or airports easier to understand than consumer. So I think it's, I mean, you know, legendary investors like Warren Buffett that preach these things. And I think it's really important with our performers. I mean, it's easy to like look at our performers in industries and say, yes, I, sh I should have caught this, but it's very hard. And the reason why it's very hard is if you look at a lot of the outperformers, especially actually in industrials, is that a lot of them fell 50% before 2012, where they, they had this wide swings um, as a whole sector. And with cyclicals, with compounders, you can get away without understanding the competitor because you've spotted something that's just so unique and you think it's going to work over the long term, where you're not really worried about what competitors do. Whereas with cyclicals or with turnarounds, you really have to understand the macro and how the macro affects the industry and then also how competitors affect that company. So you have you need a much deeper understanding of why this would change. And I think with cyclicals, with turnarounds, I don't really think there's a shortcut um, with building that competency with the industry. And I mean, when, when I was reflecting on, when I was looking at the companies that had done very well and I was trying to make that self-reflection, um, I think one of the lessons for me was if I'm going to invest in cyclicals, I really need to spend a lot of time trying to understand um, how, the, how the cycle works and what drives the demand, the supply of that cycle. I, think, I, think, I don't think there's any, um, there's any shortcut to that. I think everyone has to just learn that work. Yeah. So outside of cyclicals, which investment style outside of compounders, turnarounds, stalwarts, and special situations do you anecdotally find the most predictable after conducting the study? You mentioned you really like consumer durables, but yeah, I'd love to get some more light on that. I think from an from an is this from an industry geography or just investment style perspective yeah like i guess an industry um i mean again for me industry i thought the consumer companies um were more predictable so i mean some of the ones from the top of my head i think if you looked at britannia and you tried to understand what exactly management were going to do i think it was kind of clear that they had a superior product so I mean, with, with turnarounds and cyclicals, you're really trying to understand, well, especially with turnarounds, you're really trying to understand if this company has a superior product. I mean, you could, the other things can be solved really quickly, but if that company doesn't have a superior product, it's going to be very hard to achieve a turnaround because it's just so much work. So I think that's the first question. Do they have a superior product? And I think answering that question 
when you have access to the customers, they might be your friends, family, might even be yourself. I think it's much easier to answer that question instead of like trying to answer if um, this renewable diesel product is better than alternatives. I mean, I have no clue about that. So I think from that perspective, um, consumer and businesses where you have access to the customers or the supply chain will be the easier ones to understand. So looking Most at... The ones were the ones where they were diversified across different areas. So, I mean, some of the case studies we did were businesses where they had several segments. So, I mean, one that comes up from my head um, was Hyperport. So we did a case, we did some case studies in the book and Hyperport, it's a German company. They basically have like a brokerage platform across real estate, insurance, and like a bunch of financials. Trying to understand, I mean, I... I even I, even though I, I could see all the annual reports and I could see all that data and I asked myself, looking back in 2012, will I have predicted this was going to be a 10 bagger? The answer is still no, because we're just doing so many things and really just trying to understand that mode without being, uh, from an outsider perspective, it was just so tough. So I think it's easier. I mean, again, investors, we, we some, I myself, me included, we sometimes try to overcomplicate things where you think an outperformer might be this loss-making company that's going to do this, something so unique and so complex or this very complex business that only only you understand what exactly they do from the annual report. Sometimes you overcomplicate things. Um, it, sometimes it could just be simpler businesses. And I think it's just easier to also focus on on those type of businesses. There were, there were so many examples of companies where they had two, three core products in one industry. They were already profitable. Um, it was very clear. They had a track record of, you know, having a star product that, Rivals just couldn't replicate, and they turned out to be outperformers. Yeah, and and you know, going back to what you were talking about, Buffett, and you know, he just absolutely loves simple businesses, right? And, um, you know, if you can if you can find businesses that have you know one or two or three core products that are likely to get better and better over time, um, you know, I think that you know your research shows that that can drive a, a business to do really really well for a really long period of time. Yeah, there are so many examples of them. I mean, I, I look back now and I'm like, I should have spent a lot more time focusing on certain areas. I mean, I, I, one of the examples we did in the book on case that it was Anta Sports. And Anta Sports, I know in China, there was a discount in China, so that obviously impacted its journey to becoming an art performer. But they literally did really simple things. They sold APRO in China, population of more than 1 billion people. And a consistent 20% EB margins. And it was very clear that they're going to end that 20% EB margins regardless of what happened. Founder led, very simple business. And it was quite straightforward. It was quite, it was quite a straightforward journey for them achieving that. A very interesting quote from the book was Among the companies that returned more than 1,000% between 2002 to 2012, only 23 of 300 companies were among the 446 outperformers between 2012 and 2022. Did you observe any specific traits in businesses that returned 10x in two consecutive decades? Yeah, 10x in two consecutive decades, it's, it's your, the odds are against you. I think one in, I mean, basically one in, one in 10 maximum would um, 10x in two decades. So I think the buy and hold forever philosophy and expect, you know, outperformance year and year for 20 years, it's, 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 good, it's going to be very tough. So in terms of the businesses, among those 23 businesses, when I looked at them, one thing stands out. Um, they came from one co one country, most of them. I, I want you to guess which one it is. India. Yeah, it was India. <laughs> I think 18, 18 of the 23 came from India. And um, outside India, you had like five businesses. One of them was Amazon, um, of course. Um, another one was Old Dominion Freight. But when I looked at the ones in India, so all the companies apart from Amazon had a market cap of less than 100 million. So Relaxo Footwear, it's one of India's largest footwear brands. Um, they had a market cap of just 4 million in 2002. And between 2002 and 2022, they grew revenues 18 fold and earnings grew like 23 fold, something like that. And these were just businesses that were able to grow for a very long time consistently. Um, one, one of the more crazy examples was Vitek Software. So Vitek Software, they basically, I, they're like constellation software where they just invest in software businesses, buy new businesses, expand into more verticals in very niche business um, critical areas. And 
over that period, I mean, they grew, they grew their revenues 59-fold, I believe, from like, yeah, they grew, they grew their revenue 59-fold and earnings grew like 188-fold between those 20 years. And, you know, these are really small businesses that they were profitable year on year for very long periods of time. I mean, Amazon was the odd one out in terms of they were quite big when they started that joint in 2002. But then, then again, you have to remember that Amazon is a very, very big market. So, I mean, I, I guess the, the summary is you look for businesses that have their competitive edge in big markets where they have small market shares and have room to grow. That was the magic formula, you would say, with those 10x in two decades companies. Excellent. So there are a few massive turnarounds in your study. So we already, you already mentioned Britannia Industries and then a couple of those ones were uh, Trex and Adobe. So for investors who are interested in turnarounds, what were the primary characteristics to search for when looking for future turnarounds? And have you recently researched any developing turnarounds that interest you? Yeah, so, I mean, the first part of the question on, like, lessons from turnarounds. So again, this was one of the, one of the, at the end of the book, I put together 10 lessons I thought I learned that were really important. Um, not, some of them are quite common, like everyone would know them, but like with, with turnarounds, the framework to use for turnarounds, I thought was useful is, um, it's, it's like this, it's, it's called the distance analysis. And one of the famous investors, Nick Sleep, he's actually used that framework in terms of his thinking on investing. So the distance or the journey per se analogy is, you want to think about these investments from a distance, time and speed angle. So with distance, you want investments that can go very far. So a very far investment will be a business that in their best scenario, they earn 10% EBIT margins, but right now they're earning 1%. So if they get things right, they can go from 1% EBIT margins to 10% EBIT margins really quickly. From a speed angle, you want things that can go really quickly. And what that happens is that reduces the journey that you need to do to get there. And then again, when you think about it from a turnaround angle, these are businesses where the problems are not product driven. They're either marketing or supply chain or cycles just turned a lot. So a good example here in the US was Trex. So Trex, they make alternative wood. I know that sounds very boring, but when you actually look at the journey of how they became a 10 bagger, it's so interesting. So they, they had the, the founder, the original founder of Trex had developed this product where he combined um, sawdust and shredded plastic. And they basically reinvented a whole product called Alternative Wood. And I think Mobile bought them and then they spun off and then they went public. And they had about 20% EB margins just in the years leading to the financial crisis. And then when the financial crisis happened, they fell to like 0.8%. So when you're thinking about it from a turnaround, you're asking yourself, what is the journey it needs to do to get back to where it was before? So now the, the, if you look at the margin, it's fallen to 1% and you're asking yourself, can you get back to 20%? The first thing is to look at the competitors. If you had looked at the competitors in 2012, you'll have realized there were no new entrants to the market. Trex, even though they were failing or struggling, they still had that market leadership. That makes the journey of being a turnaround so much easier because you're not really thinking about, do I need to change my product? You just need to like re reorganize cost, cut down in certain areas, improve your marketing process. And that's exactly what new management did. And if you look at the journey, they went from, you know, having poor margins back to where they were in 2005. And it became, um, an eight, I think they went back to 18% EB margins and then became a 10 backer just from margin expansion alone. Um, some other examples are even easier. So again, I mentioned like Antisports. So Antisports, they do April in China. And then what had happened in China was that in 2008, after the Olympics, um, all the Chinese brands in apparel had expanded very aggressively um, to just get market share in the years building up to the Olympics. And then after the Olympics, people, um, tourists left China, you know, people were less excited about sports. The market basically crashed. So if you looked at Anta Sports, you'll have noticed in 2012, the share price fell by 75%. But where it got really interesting was that even though the share price fell by, you know, 75%, the EBIT margin only fell by 2%. So it still earned 18% EBIT margins and was PE ratio fell to like four times. If you compare that to their rivals, like Leaning and some other players, they went loss-making. So the journey of getting back, you know, to where they were before was going to be so much easier. Why? Because 
They had cash on their balance sheet. They were still profitable. They had much better run stores. And, you know, the management realized that and they just worked on improving Panta Sports back to where they were before. So the journey to being an outperformer was a lot less complicated than leaning, for example, who had to like raise capital and get private equity money and, you know, invent new products, that sort of thing. So I think overall with turnarounds, um, it's, it's, if, you, if you utilize that distance journey and um, framework and keep it easier for yourself where it's less product driven turnarounds, um, it's so much easier to really understand um, the journey to get in there. And I guess from, uh, from my portfolio, I don't, I used to spend a lot of time on turnarounds. Um, right now, we have shifted. I mean, I've always looked at compounders, but our portfolio is more weighted towards compounders. But in South Africa, we had two turnarounds that um, we invested in. One was MTN Group, which is the largest telecom player in Africa. And when I look at, when I look, go back to the distance journey analysis framework, uh, MTN, they had fallen COVID and um, there's a lot of pessimism in terms of Nigeria because of oil prices crashing during COVID. So as a turnaround, um, these are more macro problems, not product problems. On the product level, people still use mobile money and it's still growing. And also data, internet is still growing as well. So when you look at telecoms, it's a declining industry in most regions, where in Africa it's still growing because um, the telecoms have actually taken market share from banks from a fin financial services lens. And then also internet is still underpenetrated there. So there's still room to grow that data volume. So in terms of a turnaround, it was easier to achieve. And that was a turnaround that we invested in three years ago. And with ShopRite, it's the largest retailer in Africa. They made some missteps in terms of their growth model and they expanded into lots of regions outside Right, what they deal with that they focus on South Africa and then just double down on their supply chain. So from a difficulty of a turnaround, it was quite easy where they just had to just shut down operations and just focus on what they did best. And I mean, that was a successful turnaround as well. Excellent. Decreasing debt and increasing operating margins were two of the big growth drivers that can be screened for. What are some other screenable metrics that you think would help investors search for future outperformers outside of, say, just evaluation? So just before answering the question, I, I used to be very like, I, I used to be very dependent on screens where I look at businesses reducing debt or increasing revenue, that sort of thing. But when I did this study, I realized screens is very past. I mean, it's, it's looking at past data. And the problem is that if you're screening companies on a debt level where they've fallen from 60% to 20%, let's say debt to capital ratio, that's good in the past. But what you're thinking about is the future. And if that company ends up doing an acquisition next year where they need to like raise debt for and debt goes back up, um, you know, that screen hasn't really helped. So I think one of the lessons that I learned from, you know, just doing the Global Our Performance book, I think... The, the best way to really screen for companies, just look at things from an A to Z lens and then just have like a two minute um, research process where you just quickly look at a business and you try to figure out where to sit and if they can, I guess, achieve good returns. So I think that was one of my takeaways from a screening lens. Um, but that said, if you have to screen because of time, I think profitability is a good way to filter out companies. So... Again, if you look at the outperformers, 82% of the companies that ended up outperforming in the 10 years, they were already profitable. So you could basically say four in five outperformers will be profitable. So you could quickly remove companies that are just unsustainably unprofitable from that list. And then also, you also want to see some, some signs of future growth um, going forward. I think growth is really important. Now, the problem with growth is that you can't, you can't really screen future growth. <laughs> um, because you could be growing 30% in the prior five years, but in the next five years, you might not even grow um, your earnings. So it's something that you just want to be really focused on and ask yourself, can this business raise volume? Can, so can they grow volume? Can they raise prices? Or can they reduce loss-making loss or less profitable segments and expand their more profitable segments? And the answer is none of those three from your five-minute initial due diligence. I think just move on to the next, next case. Hey guys, I just wanted to jump in here quickly and tell you about today's sponsor. Few investments make a better long-term hedge against inflation, depression, 
in economic downturns than precious metals like gold and silver. And that is why I'm excited to tell you today about Noble Gold Investments. Noble Gold Investments is America's trusted provider of precious metals as they've secured over $1 billion in precious metals for their clients. They offer physical gold and silver coins, and they even let you invest in gold and silver through an IRA, allowing you to not only protect yourself against economic calamity, but also receive tax benefits as well. Noble Gold Investments is not just a company. It's your financial guardian for life. It stands for integrity, efficiency, and the American way. And this month, with any qualifying precious metals IRA, you'll receive a free 5-ounce solid silver America the Beautiful bullion coin. That's right, a free 5-ounce silver coin. Noble Gold Investments is here to help our listeners who want to invest in gold and silver. All you have to do is go to billionairesgold.com. That's billionairesgold.com to get this exclusive offer. You did a good job of separating industries in your research and showcase that certain industries just aren't great outperformers from your data set. Do you think poor performing industries will mean revert and produce uh, more outperformers in the next decade after 2022? And if so, which industries or themes seem uh, ripe for the future? So from an outperformance lens, there's some industries that are at a disadvantage. So when we, when we, talk about our performers, we're really looking for profitable growth. Now, for some industries, it's hard to actually achieve profitable growth at a fast rate. One, it could be regulation. So when you think about utilities, they're just not built to grow yeah. um, because if they're growing by raising prices, um, polit like when you think about the political climate and regulatory risk, they're going to be on their toes and they're going to have to cut prices to improve life for consumers. So when you look at utilities, that was the worst segment, only five outperformers, and all five are renewable businesses. And because renewable has a lot of support from a subsidy lens in terms of governments, it was able to grow, but that's not gonna last forever. So if you remove the renewable segment from out, from utilities, there was no outperformer. And I don't say that main reverting, because I think it's gonna be that the case. So. I'm not saying, and that doesn't mean you shouldn't invest in utilities. I think if you're investing in utilities, you want it to be more value driven, where on average they trade 10 times earnings, but there's been some pessimism and now they fall into like four or five times earnings. So you could see them doubling or tripling in that sense. But expecting 10 baggers from, you know, gas or water producing companies, I don't think that's going to happen. And the same thing goes for like financial segments where you look at banks and insurers. So insur insurance as an industry, most companies have to pick between good combined ratios of good profitability with growth. So if you're growing, there's a high chance that you're going into you know, weaker profile customers to insure. And that has a long-term problem. So insurance, though, I think there was only one outperformer from insurance, and that was a Saudi company. And Saudi, if you look at that 10, day, 10 years, they had the fastest insurance market, uh, life insurance market in the world. I think it was growing about 9% per year. And Bupa Arabic, which was the outperformer from insurance, did really well in terms of being able to drive innovation. And it was really the innovation in the product that was able to drive sales and profits. So, But that's not the case across all insurance markets, either sub-markets or geographies. So it's going to be very difficult for you to see ins um, insurance produce outperformance going forward. But if you look at financials, it was mainly the non-banks, and there's only one bank. So banks, you know, it's also not a great place to look for for outperformers, and I don't think that's going to mean revert in the future. But again, financials, I think you have to look for places where they're not under the same regulatory um, scrutiny as banks and insurers. So I think that will be a great place to invest in when you look going forward. Um, so you think about financial exchanges, you think about research houses or, um, and, or, or loan platforms, I think that could be interesting. Um, the other segments that did really well, I think those were information technology, healthcare materials. I think if you look at the 10 years, there was a lot of multiples expansion in information technology and sub segments like semiconductors. If you look at 2002, 2012, there was only one outperformer from semiconductors. And then in the decade after, there was 49. So it's very clear things go up and down with semiconductors. So again, the mistake people make is that this has worked for the last 10 years, it's going to work for the future. 
not really the case. It goes up and down. And you really want to, want to understand why exactly it's going up and down. So I think things like semiconductors would have to go down at some point and then come back up later. And just being realistic with that assumption, I think you'll save yourself a lot of trouble. And then lastly, with materials, that was a surprise for me because materials, I really see them as commodities that go up and down. But then if you look at the performance, it did really well. I think about 15% of our performance came from materials. And in this case, what we had was that you had materials that had either cost advantage, so they were the lowest cost producers in your industry, or they were diversified into, I guess, more advanced materials where you had to put in a lot more technology or innovation. And that, was, that allowed them to, I guess, build their moat um, in the industry and also drive volume growth. So from that angle, when you think about where technology is growing and where the world's growing, I think things are becoming a lot more technical so industries like materials and industrials, even in a world where we're moving more into technology, I still think there'll be room for growth there. So I will still say, look at those segments, even though they did really well over the last 10 years. 36% of your old performers had negative returns in 2011 to 2013, meaning if you'd owned them before that period and sold due to declining price fluctuations, you would have missed out on a hell of a lot of upside. I'm interested in knowing if these businesses had easily visible and improving profits in that 2011 to 2013 time period. And, and a couple of names that you mentioned uh, were NVIDIA, Netflix, Anta Sports, uh, Salmar, and Abbott India. Yeah, I mean, there was a mix show. So the cyclical businesses, what happened during that period was that they were actually falling in, rev, um, in profits. So in that, in that bucket, some of the cyclical businesses were the salmon stocks. So Salma, I believe, had fallen by 60% in terms of earnings um, during that period. And same thing with the semiconductor company. So NVIDIA, that's a giant now, was unprofitable in 2012, I believe. So at that period, that was when I think semiconductor sales fell by minus 2%. And then the fall was even more drastic with GPUs because gaming fell that year in terms of PC sales and PlayStation sales as well. So NVIDIA had done quite badly um, from a profit lens and also from a share price lens. Now, when you look at those cyclical companies, again, the frameworks are very different. When you look at those type of cyclical companies, you're looking for technical barriers to entry. So you're looking for, you, you want to be in those cyclical sectors where a new player can't just come in. So Apple cannot just start building their own GPUs or if you look at someone, uh, a chicken or a poultry farmer can't just say, I want to start, you know, producing salmon the next day. You, you actually have to have the right aquatic regions and not everywhere has that. Now, by being in those technical barriers to entries, you're in a much safer situation. Why? Because the existing players are more likely to still be there when the cycle turns, rather than new players coming in and flooding the market. You have another group of companies where it wasn't necessarily cycles, it was more, I guess, product lens or micro factors and um, you had lots of examples there so like netflix you know shifting more to streaming the economics initially didn't work then it started working and as they grew volume it was quite clear that the economics are going to work and in that case it's it's more qualitative than quantitative because rather than looking at you know how this business has done from a dvd lens you're really trying to understand exactly what happens with streaming why does streaming work why as a user and why am I going to spend spend $10, $15 per month on streaming? Why are they going to be able to keep content costs low? How reputable is this as a business? And I guess for those type of business, you're more focused on the qualitative factors. And if I, I think for some of them, if you spend a lot more time there, you're able to get a better sense of the competitive advantage over the arrival. So like with Netflix, for example, they literally created that segment. And it was only up until 2019 where you had players like Apple, um, Disney. And as you can see how the share price performed after that, you see it struggled for a bit. That's really when it became much more of a problem. I'd like to move on to learning a little bit more about Jenga Investment Partners. Can you go over the evolution from an investment club to a hedge fund? And how did it start? And how does your investment strategy differ from other funds? So I, I personally started investing at the age of 10. Um, that was really where my journey started and was through my dad. Um, he used his savings to buy stocks and then he told me to buy stocks because it's a great way um, to make long-term investments. And 
I bought a few stocks in Nigeria and then four years later, some of them had quadrupled in price. And I told myself, you know, this is so easy. <laughs> Why don't I spend all my time doing this? And then I realized it's not that easy. But during that whole journey of understanding more stocks, I realized I actually fell in love with just understanding how businesses work. And in university, I started an investment club where I was investing for friends in university and family and later um, people I didn't know. And what happened or what caused that transition was really just a deep passion. When you have a passion for something, you want to take it more seriously, like a football you know, kid you know, who plays football at home. You're like, you know, I'm so I'm good at this. Why don't I, you know, play for an actual club? So, I mean, that was what happened. And after university, I, you know, I met people in the industry who were able to help out on the operational side of the business, and then were able to take it, you know, into something that's regulated and more serious. Um, from a, from a strategy lens, we are global long only equities, so we look at public stocks um, around the world, and we have no um, industry or geography barriers, so we can look anywhere. We only really look at businesses that have a market cap of above fifty million dollars um, um, as a strategy. In terms of, I guess, what we do, I, 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 what I would say is we try to do the little things slightly better. So how we understand companies, the questions we ask, the curiosity we show when we're looking at trying to understand businesses, where we look for the facts, how we stress test the facts and the insights. So that's what we really try to do. Um, I think one of the mistakes is a lot of younger investors that they try to reinvent the wheel. And um, what I've learned is that you don't really need to reinvent the wheel. What you really need is consistency, discipline. And that's really just what I try to focus on as an investor. Excellent. What lessons from your study on global outperformers had the biggest impact on how you run the fund now? Oh, there were so many of them. Um, but I think, so I think I'll start off from a geography lens. So. I think one of, one of the struggles as an investor is that you have, as much as you're thinking about return on your investment, you also need to be thinking about return on time. And you need to make sure return on time, Bill Ackman says this thing, return on brain capacity. So the amount of energy you're spending trying to understand an investment, you want to make sure that you're in the highest return factors. And there are only two ways to really know if you're, I guess, in those right buckets. And that's either by studying what successful in investors are currently doing. So looking at what Warren Buffett is doing and all the key good investors are doing, or you're looking at what has worked in the past and asking yourself, why has this worked and if it will keep working? So by doing global outperformance, I was able to answer that second question by really trying to understand what exactly was working and why it was working. So for example, it was really clear to me that I needed to spend a lot more time as a global investor understanding what's going on in Asia. And it's not just because Asia had 59% of all our performance, it's understanding why exactly it had those our performance, where exactly they were based, they were of in the smaller companies. And within with Asia, if you look at their index returns, it's gonna look very bad. So like China, for example, has returned 1.3% for the last 30 years. Now, if I tell you this market has really returned 1.3%, you're not going to want to spend that much time in terms of looking for our performance. But again, again, China was among the top five performers from an outperformance lens. And it's about going into the smaller cap companies, having good filters to you know remove crappy companies from the good ones and spending a lot more time on the good ones. So I think that was my key lesson, knowing where exactly to focus my time on from a geography lens and also from an industry lens. Um, I, I spent maybe half of my time on consumer discretion and staples. And then when I did the research, I realized, you know, I actually have to spend a lot more time on other industries, especially the ones where I think I have some circle of competence within. Um, so that, that was my lesson from, I guess, from a top higher level. And I guess from a more micro level, well, not really micro, from a strategy level was understanding that there was life beyond compounders. So I know 2021, 2020, you know, investors got really excited about the idea of compounders, businesses that grow year on year, every year. It's great. I mean, I think for, if you look at what's going to drive returns over the long term, I think the compounders would be the biggest drivers. But I don't think as investors, especially if you have a flexible minded way, you can look at both growth and value. I think you should also be open to cyclicals and turnarounds as well. And for me as a strategy, you know, looking, doing this research and seeing how many like, Great investments even came from turnarounds, biscuit makers, you know, and all these weird 
simple, low-growing industries, um, it, it made me a lot more excited about the future of cyclicals and turnarounds. And, and then finally, I guess the other big lesson was just basic frameworks to think about investments. So, I mean, one of the investments frameworks that I learned or I doubled down on after doing the book was this idea of value chain investing. So what happens in, in civilization is that every age or every decade you have this new technology and innovation that drives or changes how we do things. It either makes life cleaner, makes life more efficient, you know, you'll spend less doing the same thing. And in the last decade, one of the big, you know, top-down changes was solar, where it made how we use energy slightly less uh, less polluted, pollution driven. So with solar, when you look at it from a bottom up, it can be very daunting because solar is quite cyclical. You might not realize, but it's actually quite cyclical. And the, and the industry is quite different from traditional oil and gas or traditional energy industries. So with solar, it's very low cost driven. So China produces like 80% of all global PVs. And if you look at, you know, oil and gas, it's quite, it's more distributed globally. So India would have their own refinery, Saudi Arabia would have their own refinery, US would have their own methods, whereas with solar, it's, it's very, you know, winner take all market. So for me, in terms of understanding this type of industry, this is where value chain really helps. Um, where you try to understand exactly how the whole ecosystem works from the polysilicon ships to the inverters and, you know, the additional supply chains in in solar. And by doing this in, in solar, you have a much, much better understanding um, of where the outperformers lie. And I, I feel like if you had done that value chain analysis in 2012, you will have very quickly realized that the outperformers in solar were very likely going to come from China. One, they had a lot more subsidies from the government. Two, they had lower cost of production. Three, they had the supply chain that could allow them export globally. So one of the outperformers was a company called Solaria Energy. They're based in Spain, and they initially used to make their own solar PVs, but they stopped that in 2010. If you, if you had done that sub value chain analysis and you saw Solaria, that had stopped making solar PVs and rather moved into utilities, that would have given you a lot of information that it makes sense why they're no longer producing their own PVs. Why? Because they just can't compete with China. So what they did was that they moved into installation and utilities. And they were able to become an outperformer by just focusing on that. And that is a lot more higher barrier because there, there's, that's where regulation comes into play. You know, government want local players in that market rather than like international players. And it's much more of a struggle for a company in China to go into installing, you know, solar PVs in, you know, sp Spanish residential roof. So, I mean, understanding that value chain gives you a really good understanding of why certain things have to happen for a business to be an outperformer. And that was a big lesson for me. So now when I think about industries like semiconductors or wind energy or hydrogen, I'm really focused on the value chain. I'm really trying to look for areas where, you know, there are certain er certain companies that can earn, you know, very strong competitive advantages over long periods of time. I really enjoyed your part on the value chain, and um, I'd like to actually jump into that just a little bit. What what value chains are you looking at now that you know might be interesting for the next decade? Are are there any types of themes or anything like that that you're seeing develop now? I mean. From a value chain, I'm still looking at solar. So what had happened with solar was that in after the pan, well, 2019 to 2022, there was a high run up in prices. And now there's been a fall. So I think if you look at the yen per kilo, by per kg prices, it's fallen by like half in the last one year. And a lot of the stocks have fallen. And I think it's still going to fall a bit before it bounces back just because that's how the cycles work. So I'm still looking at the solar chain just to have that understand. So even though I've written this book, I seem to do a lot more, a lot more research and understanding how the the value chain works. So I'm still I'm still spending some time looking at you know you know solar and lithium cycle. Um, semiconductor I think is really important when you think about the impact AI is going to have for the future. Sadly, um, some segments of the of the value chain have already taken off, where it's very hard to see you know potential margin of safety going forward. 
but there are other segments that I think would be indirect um, mm -hmm. beneficiaries of any you know technological technological advancements in AI. Um, so that's something I'm spending quite a bit of time trying to understand who are the people producing stuff or giving services to you know the fa huge foundries in um, in Taiwan and and South Korea. Mm -hmm. Where's the area for you know that. With the area for you know improved costs in the value chain, so that's that's an area that I'm spending quite a bit of time in. So you mentioned that um, you know you've you, you've kind of moved away from quantitative measuring and more to the qualitative end of things. How do you integrate uh, the qualitative analysis into your investment process at the fund level in terms of you know capital allocation, management, uh, looking at total available market? At the big picture level. Whether you're looking qualitative or quantitative, whether portfolio management is a function of two things, you're trying to reduce risk or you're trying to increase returns. Any other thing is a distraction. That's really what you're trying to do. Now, at a personal level, you have constraints. So you have sectors that you understand or you can actually value the risk level or the potential return level. So that's one constraint. Another might just be regions that you're just not comfortable with. So for example, some people might just not be comfortable with investing in China. So you have those constraints and you have to walk around those constraints as an investor. So for me as an investor, how I'm incorporating that qualitative factor is being able to widen uh, my circle of competence. So I'm spending a lot more time just trying to understand how different countries work. You know, why our business is great, 20% each year in India. And, you know, why there's so many great Indian chemical companies. And just trying to find my, spend some time just understanding, you know, how these businesses work. So I think that any investor can do that. You don't need, you know, you don't need to be an institution. You could be a retail investor and still commit a lot of your time to just expanding that circle of competence over time. Um, so I think that that for me is really the the big way um, as an investor um, with with being able to incorporate that qualitative factors in, in in your investment process. The second big thing is when you're trying to size up investment. So I mean. Is one of the things I've had to learn. Or had to learn when I was running the investment club. Um, I really learned really quickly that you know picking stocks is very different from managing a portfolio, and the later I learned is actually very different from also running the business as well. But from a portfolio lens, being able to size up investments, I mean, the qualitative factor because it can really impact the risk uh, in the business. Um, it by understanding or having or putting the qualitative factors into your investment process you're able to really size up investment. So when you're trying to make decisions on, shall I make this stock a 10% position or a 5% position, when do I sell? Or which will I be more strict in terms of set a target price, for example? I think the qualitative factors are a lot more important there. So I'll give you an example here. So with cyclicals, my view is that for compounders, you can be a lot more, you could be less, rigid with target prices because the potential is quite wide. There are a lot of things a business can do if they keep compounding, building, going to new markets and driving volume. Whereas with price, there's a limit to how price can go. So with if you go back to the solar panel, um, solar cycle, for example, there's a limit really to where the solar PV price should be. So for me, as a qualitative factor, I've put those understand how the cycle works from a qualitative angle to really size up the pricing um, power potential. So if a business cycle goes above a certain price, I'm a lot more strict as an investor that even though this is going very well and I've made money on this stock, I'm just going to sell because when it turns, it turns really aggressively and it's very easy to lose 50% of your money in that cycle turns. So for me... I mean, that, that's one of my takeaways when I was trying to understand, you know, qualitative analysis and understand the cycles that I learned from global performers. As your research highlights, many more underperform than outperform. Knowing that what you've learned from the study, let's invert and look at some of the underperformers. What are some of the less obvious characteristics of underperformers that you're actively trying to avoid at all costs? So first... Inverting is like, it's very important. Uh, so one of the most important things from the book is that I actually need to invert my ideas and just stress test them. So I was actually going to write a second book called Global Underperformers. 
but I realized half of the book is going to be bashing companies. <laughs> and I didn't want to get any legal situations where I'm insulting companies and telling them, yeah, this is bad. You've done badly for 10 years. So we pulled that off and just did global outperformers. So one of the key things, one of the key things I learned when I was thinking about global underperformance is that a lot more companies underperform. So when I say underperform, I mean either companies that are flat for 10 years than end up growing, you know, being 10 baggers. So I think among the 27,000 companies that were around 10 years ago, I think about 9,000 of them were flat. So either flat or they fell in that 10 year period. So about a third of them, you just didn't grow share price wise. Now, when I think about, when, I, when you look more at the numbers uh, from, a, from a factor lens, there were certain categories that mattered more. So for example, growth was very important. So I think, I think the number, I might be wrong here, but I think the number here was that 7% of the businesses that underperformed, so when I mean underperformed, where they performed less than 0%, only 7% of them actually grew 10% earnings over that 10-year period. So basically, the number is that nine in ten of the underperformers will be businesses that just don't grow their earnings. So for me, that really emphasizes how important earnings growth is in any investment case. So I think, as an investor, I know we like to pick between value and growth. I think it's just very important that with every investment you're trying to make, except it's trading at like one times earnings or like or like two times earnings, but like if it's not trading at like some huge discount. I think it's very important to make sure that investment is going to be able to exercise some form of earnings growth. So I'll give you some, some of the companies that underperformed like in the 10-year period. So there was IBM, there was at and there was Vodafone, there was General Electric. If you look at all those companies, none of them grew earnings during that 10-year period. And that's why they underperformed. It was just quite clear. So for me, you know, when you're inverting um, earnings growth, I think that was a very important factor. Profit was also in, important, but I mean, for profits, and profit is, I think a lot more companies were profitable, but still underperformed. So I wouldn't say profit, being just profitable is enough. I think you need that profitability, but also earnings growth, and of course, low multiples. And I guess just to conclude, there are some mistakes out of, when you're looking at outperformers people make. So I know a large percentage of, you know, our performers were founder-led businesses. So a lot of investors to say, I want investments with that founder-led and have high insider, you know, um, share purchases. But the, I don't know, I don't have the numbers with me, but a lot of the companies that underperformed and the ones that went to zero and went bankrupt were also founder-led businesses. So, you know, you don't want to just focus on just that, you know, one, that founder-led factor that, oh yeah, you know, this company became an outperformer because it was founder-led, hence every founder-led business would out outperform. It doesn't really work that way. You have to go back to what really matters. What matters is that you're able to grow earnings by at least 15% year on year for 10 years. You're at low multiples and you're improving your businesses. Of course, being founder-led, having an owner-oriented mentality would be, um, would be a key factor there, but it's not about the founder led it's about the fact that you're a good business and you made your business better and you grew over time. So it's very important to focus on what matters. That's why we didn't do like a big research on like founder led businesses because again, you know, it could be you could have very wide outcomes with founder led businesses. Dede, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience connect with you and learn more about Jenga IP and your research? So our research are all on our website, which is jengaip, J-E-N-G-A-I-P dot com. Um, I tweet often on Twitter, so you could also see some of my thoughts when I'm reading edits calls on, on Twitter if you're interested in that. Excellent. And my handle is my first name underscore my last name. And did you want to just spell that out for the audience? Yes, yeah, D-E-D-E underscore E-Y-E-S-A-N. But you want a business that can compound capital at that kind of rate. So once you find businesses that are like that, that have those good returns, then you really have to kind of dig in and figure out why they earn those returns. Because we know the nature of capitalism is that there's going to be competition. If you're over there making all kinds of money, it's not like 
Uh, you're just going to keep doing it and no one's going to pay any attention. People are going to be like, wow, she's making all kinds of money in her business. Maybe I should do something similar. And that's what kind of brings down those returns on capital is having a lot of competition. So I spend a lot of time and I would recommend this is where investors should put most of their time figuring out what makes that business special. Why are they able to earn those kinds of returns? What kind of competitive advantage do they have over their competition? And how are they going to be able to protect that return over a long period of time. 